federal judge has ordered the release of the identities of dozens of people mentioned in the court documents related to convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. The papers could reveal more than 150 people who were associated with Epstein. Epstein was an operator. Even if you take the absolute minimalist view of what Epstein could have been up to, I mean, he was a crook through and through. How many other people has this happened to? How many other stories are sitting in a vault in an ABC News or an NBC News vault of powerful people that they wanted to preserve their relationship with? On the morning of December 5th, 2010, Woody Allen was photographed here with his wife and uh, stepdaughter, leaving the Upper East Side mansion of New York financier and at that point recently convicted pedophile Jeffrey Edward Epstein. Over a decade ago, I doubt the average American had even heard the name Jeffrey Epstein. Yet, the 57-year-old had just gotten off house arrest for soliciting a minor for prostitution and registered as a sex offender only three months prior to the big celebration he was throwing for the Duke of York and then fourth in line to the throne, Prince Andrew, as journalist Alexandra Wolfe reported all the way back in 2011. While several of his guests that day, which included the ABC anchor George Stephanopoulos, CBS personalities Katie Couric and Charlie Rose, and comedian Chelsea Handler have all expressed regret for not doing more research into their host, except for Charlie Rose, who was actually pretty close to Epstein and would even meet girls through him, all of these people were convenient that day in a $77 million mansion that would later be dubbed a house of depravity by Epstein's victims. Physicist Lawrence Krauss, despite knowing exactly why Epstein had spent time in jail, told the Daily Beast in 2011, I do not feel tarnished in any way by my relationship with Jeffrey. I feel raised by it. Everyone and their dog is now aware that Jeffrey Epstein had connections in the highest of high places, but the specific nature of those connections has always largely been shrouded in mystery. And that may be by design. These connections include, but of course are not limited to, well-respected scientists, scholars, actors, lawyers, real estate moguls, US presidents, and international leaders from all around the globe. While Prince Andrew's now infamous camaraderie with Epstein made it quite the splash in British media 10 years ago? Prince Andrew's ex-wife was given £15,000 by his American friend Jeffrey Epstein to pay off some of her debts. That friend, a convicted sex offender. The American press stayed unusually quiet back then. This Daily Beast article was one exception, but even Wolf herself asks in it why nobody, particularly New York socialites, seemed to know or even care about what Epstein had just admitted to doing in Palm Beach. Remember, this dinner party happened three years years after Epstein very publicly pled guilty to procuring a minor for sex and eight years before he would be arrested again on federal charges of human trafficking, then die under mysterious circumstances that remain the subject of intense debate today, even becoming somewhat of a running joke. Thank you so much, James. Yep. And remember, Epstein didn't kill himself. Okay, got it. <laughs> very clever. <laughs> what? And now, with a judge recently ordering thousands of past court documents to be unsealed, Epstein and friends are back under the spotlight of public scrutiny once again. With all the pop base, pop crave, poo crave Twitter accounts teasing the news like it was a new Travis Scott album or something. For a while, you could even place bets on which celebrities might be exposed as an Epstein client. Did you see Bet Online is letting people bet money on who will be on the Epstein list? I'm doing that right now. Wait, what? <laughs> an official uh, official betting pool for it? Harvey Weinstein, easy slam dunk, Hillary, probably. Joe Biden. I think he's probably too old. Like, I don't even think he knows what planes are right now. Which is a long way of saying that despite the man himself being long gone, the Epstein saga is anything but over. This story has fascinated and frustrated me for as long as I've been paying attention to it. And the more you dig in, the more questions seem to crop up. It's a complex tale, often mired in conspiracy and littered with political interests. Bill Clinton. Nice guy. Uh, got a lot of problems coming up, in my opinion, with the famous island 
with Jeffrey Epstein. A lot of problems. My brother in Christ, you were on the plane. This video not only attempts to outline the years long behavior Epstein and company were said to participate in, it's also about shedding light on what we still don't know and what we may very well never know. We won't get to everything today since this is only one part of what will eventually be a three part series, but I hope it can at least be a starting point for those not as privy to the timeline of the late traffickers reign of terror and those who maintained correspondence with the man even after his guilt became abundantly clear. Everyone now knows the name Jeffrey Epstein, but the question I intend on answering is how it all came to this. Tonight, more newly unsealed court documents just released involving accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. Tonight, the blast radius from Jeffrey Epstein's reach continues to grow. The accuser in the case did claim that she met the former president on Epstein's private island. Jeffrey Epstein's mansion was a hive of activity today amid uproar over his suicide behind bars. Jeffrey Epstein victims recounted in sworn depositions about the many powerful and famous men they met in Jeffrey Epstein's orbit. I don't know what to make out of these documents. I don't know how these lists were compiled. And I have nothing to do with that. You know, that's not my business. What I'm concerned about is my brother's murder. Yeah, I'm talking about Jeff Epstein, the New York financier. Yes! <laughs> we're talking about the same Jeff Epstein. No. Yes. No. Yes. I, what? I never, I never heard. Oh, it was a big story in the news. Huge. Jeff Said, Epstein. Yes. I'm pretty sure, with respect, if there was some news about Jeff Epstein, I would have heard. But let's just pause for a moment here and allow today's sponsor, Ground News, to help us understand how Jeffrey Epstein, Jimmy Kimmel, and my mortal enemy as a Cowboys fan, Aaron Rodgers, all wound up in the same sentence recently. See, the Ground News app and website gather related news articles from around the world and provide context about the source of the information for a more accurate understanding of current events. So when Aaron Rodgers suggested Jimmy Kimmel was associated with Epstein on Pat McAfee, show, you can imagine how the internet responded. But with Ground News, I can see that out of 150 articles, the majority of the coverage has come from either left or center-leaning publications. I can see all the ways the media chose to frame the controversy. Scripts highlighting Jimmy's response, setting the record straight that he's never been in contact with Epstein. While Breitbart's preview mentioned how upset Aaron got for the way the media, including ESPN, tried to cancel him instead of focusing on the real criminal. But The Hill showed me a quote from Aaron saying he understands why Jimmy got so upset he threatened to sue, but he's also not stupid enough to seriously make a claim like that with zero evidence. Seeing these different angles on the same story in one place with clear markers highlighting a source's political leaning, reliability, and ownership so I'm aware of any bias that could be affecting its reporting is one of the most interesting features of ground news. I feel like I can truly trust my perception of the world because I'm not getting my news from just one potentially biased source. So check it out for yourself by going to ground.news slash jobbery right now. You can even get 30% off the Vantage plan if you subscribe through my link, which is what I use, or try it for less than $1 this month. Huge thanks again to the wonderful people at Ground News for sponsoring this video and helping us all see through misinformation and media bias. One of the most robust biographies of Jeffrey Epstein we have was written by his own legal defense team following his initial indictment in Palm Beach, handed over to state prosecutors in 2007 by one of Epstein's lawyers who also made sure to attach a smug, handwritten note that read, enjoy some fun reading on your defendant. Obtained in 2019 by the Palm Beach Post, the generous wording of this thing should be entirely expected. I mean, it was written by his defense team after all. It glowingly recounts all the times Epstein lent a helping hand to the people around him and includes testimonies of former girlfriends Eva Anderson and Ghislaine Maxwell. Being sure to mention that the reason Epstein has shied away from becoming a parent is because the demands of his business would not allow him the kind of time and presence needed to be a good parent. 
I'm sure that's what it is. To back up a little here, it also notes that Epstein was born in Coney Island, Brooklyn, New York in January 1953. Jeffrey and his younger brother Mark were raised in a middle class environment by their two parents, Pauline, a school aide, and Seymour, a groundskeeper for the city of New York. It's always mentioned that he liked to play the piano and that he did so well academically that he was able to graduate Lafayette High School two years early when he was just 16. Before going on to study math and physics at the Cooper Union, for a few years. Epstein never graduated, but he did transfer to NYU where he would also not graduate. So the natural question becomes, how did a two-time college dropout get a job at teaching math at the prestigious Dalton School the same year he left NYU behind? After all, the Dalton Schools produced a number of notable alumni, including Chevy Chase, Anderson Cooper, Sean Ono Lennon, and specifically while Epstein was there, Prudence Murdoch, daughter of Fox News, found founder Rupert Murdoch and actress Jennifer Grey, according to NPR. The New York Times reports that the school's headmaster at the time Epstein was hired was Donald Barr, who, fun fact, is the father of William Barr, the U.S. Attorney General under Trump, who you may know for being in charge of the DOJ when Epstein died in custody decades later. Which is just one of the many strange tidbits we'll see throughout this story, like the fact that Donald Barr once wrote a book called Space Relations about a planet ruled by oligarchs who engage in child sex slavery. So I'm glad that's something I know, and now so do you. As former Dalton social studies teacher Susan Samel told the Times, Barr was explicitly looking to hire teachers with less conventional backgrounds in the field. And while Epstein was about as unconventional as it got, he was barely 21 years old, had no experience in the world of education, I mean he's a two-time dropout and would show up to school wearing fur coats and gold chains that would dangle in front of his grossly exposed hairy chest. I'm sorry for the mental image, but I think it's worth illustrating here in detail. His tenure at Dalton, though, wouldn't last long, according to the interim headmaster who alluded to Epstein's lack of effectiveness. If you ask his students what they thought about the eccentric instructor, the consensus seems to vary. Some described him as caring and attentive, while others recall a clear inappropriateness about the way he conducted himself. It's also been reported that he'd attend student parties where underage drinking would occur, to the point that it would become widely talked about among the school. Epstein's bizarre behavior even made it all the way up to the headmaster that replaced Barr, Gardner Dunnan, whose attorney has since told the Times he denies being aware of any concerns of Epstein's conduct. It's also worth noting that Dunham himself was later accused of sexually assaulting a 14-year-old. Epstein may have been out at Dalton, but he sure wasn't down on his luck struggling to find his next gig either. Ever since the beginning, one of his few talents may have been his ability to suck up to the gaggle of powerful people in his vicinity. Robert Couturier, an interior designer who knew Epstein during the 80s, told Vanity Fair in 2021 that Epstein was a flatterer, with a woman named Leon Koppel telling the Miami Herald to give Jeff credit. He knew how to woo people, how to schmooze, and she would know her father Ace Greenberg is the one who gave Epstein a job at Bear Stearns, a now failed investment bank on Wall Street. Greenberg, a Bear Stearns chairman who was reportedly introduced to Epstein through Dalton was clearly fascinated in the young teacher and saw great potential for him in the economic world despite his lack of experience in, well, anything that wasn't sniffing the farts of the most powerful people in the room. Something I find odd is that Epstein miraculously kept finding himself in these highly desirable job positions when he was less than qualified to fulfill them. He was a lackluster candidate at best, yet he was still, for some reason, being paid by billionaires like Leon Black extraordinarily well, better than most money managers would would have been getting paid, in fact, begging the question, what exactly made Epstein so uniquely appealing to these people? I mean, they could have hired anyone in the world to do a better job for a way lower rate. It doesn't make sense. But Black and Greenberg weren't the only fans of the underqualified 20-something. Even the future CEO of Bear Stearns, James Kane, was happy to take Epstein under his wing during his time at the firm, as Time Magazine reported that Epstein worked his way up from a lowly junior assistant to a floor trader before becoming a limited partner in 1980. The same year, Cosmopolitan crowned him Bachelor of the Month. With this little magazine snippet that claimed the 27-year-old talks only to people who make over a million a year. If you're a cute Texas girl, write this New York dynamo at 55 Water Street. All I can hope now is that no Texas girl actually did that. He left the next year to start his own thing, but continued trading with Bear Stearns until their collapse in 08. Around the time Epstein was experiencing somewhat of a collapse of his own, but don't 
don't worry, he'd still have plenty of ways to move massive hordes of money around all the way up until his death. But let's just put all of that to the side for a second. First, talk about one of Epstein's more lucrative connections he made up until this point. A peculiar little character by the name of Les Wexner, whose real-time net worth hovers around a humble six billion dollars, is the 86-year-old founder of a global retailing empire. Launching the clothing company The Limited all the way back in 1963, Wexner went on to make a series of business acquisitions that allowed his influence to expand exponentially over the following decades. He acquired Victoria's Secret in 1982, Abercrombie and Fitch in 1988, Bath and Body Works in 1990, and by 2003, Fortune magazine considered limited brands the most admired specialty retailer in the world. And at that point in time, Wexner's financial manager was none other than Jeffrey Epstein. His ties to Columbus native Wexner have been brought into the national spotlight. The genesis of Epstein and Wexner's decades-long close, close friendship is somewhat of a debate due in part to how murky Epstein's life became after leaving Bear Stearns, but also thanks to Epstein's conflicting answers as to which year the two buddies officially met. First bragging about the investment advice he gave to Wexner in 1986, only to seemingly backtrack and say he didn't begin advising him until 1989, actually. Regardless, Wexner didn't shy away from describing to Vanity Fair just how close the two were, calling Epstein very smart with a combination of excellent judgment and unusually high standards. Whatever that means. But then again, this was his quote, most loyal friend, at least in 2003. And I know you may be wondering, hey, this was years before Jeffrey Epstein got publicly exposed as a serial sex trafficker. So is it really that fair to criticize the guy if he didn't know Epstein was bad until at least 2008? And I might agree with that if Wexner hadn't been so personally involved with the man to the point where Epstein reportedly told a friend that Wexner knows everything about me. He knows every experience I've had. With Vanity Fair also noting that Wexner was warned hundreds of times by Robert Meister, who originally introduced the two men, to drop Epstein after learning about his sexual proclivities before 2008. But it wasn't just Meister sounding the alarm bells. Harold Levin and Jerry Merritt, who both worked for Wexner, told Vanity Fair they too warned their boss of Epstein's shadiness. Yet, despite it all, to this day, Wexner denies knowing anything about his former best friend's criminal behavior, telling employees he was never aware of the illegal activity and would never have guessed that a person I employed more than a decade ago could have caused such pain to so many people, even though he would have known exactly that. In fact, I find it basically impossible for Wexner to not know that his, quote, most loyal friend had been going around and lying to women about his relationship with Victoria's Secret by falsely labeling himself a modeling recruiter, according to one police report, which also included the claim that Epstein had groped model Alicia Arden in 1997. And that's not to mention when a year prior, an artist named Maria Farmer reached out to authorities claiming Epstein had assaulted her while working on Wexner's Ohio property. She filed a police report, but somehow Wexner never caught wind of any of that, I guess, and didn't cut ties until 18 months after charges were brought against Epstein in Palm Beach. In fact, Epstein Epstein not only remained Wexner's power of attorney for almost two decades, he also served as a trustee on the board of the Wexner Foundation, oversaw the construction of his super yacht, and even drafted a prenup for Wexner and his wife. And if that wasn't enough, Wexner would reportedly sell Epstein a Boeing 727 for $10 million in 2000, and also allow Epstein to take possession of his multi-million dollar Upper East Side mansion for the low, low price of free. Which is a long way of saying that there's a special place in the afterlife for Mr. Wexner. While we're on the subject, one of the greatest mysteries surrounding Jeffrey Epstein to this day is where he acquired the massive fortune he used to bankroll his decades of international criminal activity. He's usually referred to in the news as a billionaire, but we really don't know how much money he exactly had at his peak. Prosecutors in 2019 estimated he had a net worth of at least half a billion dollars, but the fact that we have no definitive explanation for where any of that really came from should 
infuriate everyone watching this. Now, Wexner is commonly speculated to at least be in part responsible for the digits in Epstein's bank account. After all, he did claim Epstein misappropriated vast sums of money from him and his family only after his, quote, most loyal friend's arrest, of course. But even if Epstein ripped off one of Wexner's charities for a quick and easy 46 million, that would barely account for the rest of his gargantuan wealth. So naturally, people are kind of forced to just guess. Some of the current acting theories have to do with blackmail, which we will explore in part two, money laundering, and his possible connection to one of the largest Ponzi schemes in American history. There's a little gap in the resume we've discussed so far. After working for Bear Stearns and before becoming Les Wexner's appointed hatchet man, Epstein began his own consulting firm, working as a bounty hunter in his own words to help clients recover stolen money, which further brought him into contact with some very rich individuals, claiming he wouldn't do business with anyone not a billionaire, even brushing elbows with members of international governments, as Vanity Fair wrote in that 2003 article. Maybe this is why law enforcement discovered a mysterious passport after for a raid on his home in 2019, which exhibited Epstein's image next to a fake name and a noted place of residence in Saudi Arabia. I promise we'll get to the Ponzi scheme thing in a second. Okay, we're almost there. His lawyers at the time said he needed this fake ID for protection as a Jewish person traveling regularly to the Middle East. Why was he going to the Middle East, you ask? Well, one of Epstein's clients at this time was identified by journalist Vicky Ward as Ednan Khashoggi, who, among other things, was a middleman in the Iran-Contra scam who helped smuggle cash for the Marcos family out of the Philippines. During his travels overseas is where Epstein was reportedly introduced by alleged arms dealer Douglas Lease, known for his involvement in a multi-billion dollar weapons deal between Saudi Arabia and the United Kingdom, to American businessman and future convicted fraudster Stephen Hoffenberg. Hoffenberg, over the next several decades, would spend 18 years behind bars for his involvement in a $475 million financial scheme that he now says Epstein masterminded. Okay, see, I told you we'd get to the Ponzi scheme thing eventually. It just took a minute, but thanks for sticking by. Hoffenberg told NPR in 2019 that he considered Epstein to be brilliant, extraordinarily gifted and talented in convincing people to buy from him. And also, he was a criminal mastermind, by the way. The criminal enterprise that Hoffenberg is describing rather openly here went by the pretty uncreative name of Towers Financial. Hoffenberg and his self-described best friend, Epstein, who worked as a paid consultant through the 80s and 90s, ran a team of people people on Wall Street, investment people that raise these billion dollars illegally, as Hoffenberg told CBS News, feeling the need to emphasize he was my guy, my wingman, which is a, personally not a term I would use to describe Jeffrey Epstein in any circumstance, but over the course of five years, prosecutors allege the company raised nine figures, almost $500 million of investors' money by selling them fake bonds. They'd then use the money to repay earlier investors while pocketing the difference, a classic Ponzi that you may be shocked to hear lasted as long as it did, but keep in mind, this was a pre-Bernie Madoff era, so a financial fraud of this scale was almost unheard of in the early 90s. The strangest part of it all, however, is that despite multiple parties being so able to recall Epstein as a prominent component of the Ponzi scheme, Epstein himself was never charged alongside his buddy Stephen Hoffenberg, who pled guilty to five criminal charges in 1995. As Terrence Corrigan, a lawyer representing over 2,800 people defrauded by Towers told CBS, as I understood, Epstein was sort of a senior VP. If he was not the number two guy, he was certainly the number two or number three person at the firm. I know we saw organization charts, and yes, Epstein's name was on them, with another attorney, one representing Towers Financial, reinforcing Corrigan's memory. Epstein was a consultant at Towers Financial. I met him there, and I drafted a consulting agreement as I was an attorney at the company. I remember him. Epstein was even mentioned in a lawsuit against the company filed by the Illinois Department of Insurance who, now you're probably wondering, why was Illinois involved? <laughs> well, they claimed Towers had carried out an illegal transfer that violated Illinois law. As you can see here, Epstein's name appears in their documents multiple times. Yet, for whatever reason, Epstein never once appeared as a defendant in the 1993 federal case against Hoffenberg. Although Hoffenberg's testimony to the grand jury included mention of Epstein being the mastermind behind the whole thing, as reported by Julie K. Brown, Epstein was nonetheless dropped from the case for reasons that are still unknown today.
While Hoffenberg was awaiting a jail sentence, Epstein was busy frolicking around the White House and schmoozing power brokers at dinners and events like the White House Historical Association fundraiser in 1993, which included such beautiful guests as Clark Clifford, a man responsible for establishing BCCI in the United States. BCCI, which we definitely don't have enough time to dive into here, was an international bank used to transfer dark money between international governments later found to be involved in a litany of shady activity, ranging from money laundering to illegal weapon sales to human trafficking. Clifford himself had charges brought against him that would be dropped, not because prosecutors thought he was innocent all of a sudden, but because of Clifford's poor health the same year that he attended this fundraiser with Epstein. Frankly, the idea that a man accused of helping to facilitate one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in American history could avoid prosecution and immediately pal around with some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in the country at an exclusive White House fundraiser is enough to turn anyone into a conspiracy theorist. Other than that 2003 Vanity Fair puff piece and a glowing profile in New York Magazine that we will get to in a bit, Epstein had lived much of his life in the shadows since the early 80s, making it all the more tricky for investigators and journalists to track his elusive movements. A lot of the insight we now know is thanks to Miami Herald journalist Julie K. Brown, who presents an extremely comprehensive timeline of events in her excellent book Perversion of Justice, which I read in preparation for this video and would recommend to anyone looking to learn more about the Epstein story. Brown, who has covered the story extensively for years now, writes that the earliest instances of Epstein's sex crimes against minors date back to the mid-90s, when, at a Michigan summer camp in 1994, he and his then-girlfriend Ghislaine approached a 13-year-old child. According to the Daily Mail article Brown cites here, the anonymous girl's mother says she looked even younger than she was. Then, years later, when Ghislaine's trial was underway in 2021, one of the lawyers representing the now convicted trafficker wrote this young victim's story off as the result of her own conduct and that the girl had voluntarily or negligently assumed a known risk, consenting to the abuse. A 13 year old. That is what lawyers representing Epstein and Ghislaine have consistently thought of the hundreds of girls who were systematically trafficked throughout their childhood. So just keep that in mind as we move forward here and discuss Epstein's track record of abuse across the United States. Some of it taking place in New York, some at his New Mexico baby farm as he called it, and of course a lot of it occurring at the Palm Beach mansion he bought in 1990. To understand Epstein's years-long pattern of abuse, we have to establish the location of this 14,000 square foot monstrosity. Unfortunately, the neighborhood that housed Epstein's $44 million oceanfront property was only a short drive away from a much less privileged privileged area of Palm Beach, Florida. Testimony from even more victims prove he explicitly sought out girls from broken families. Girls who were either homeless or on the verge of homelessness, those who came from tragic backgrounds wrought by addiction, suicide, and abuse already. Girls who lived in trailer homes and were in and out of foster homes. Girls who Epstein knew would not be taken seriously by the legal system. A prediction that his infamous plea agreement years later would ultimately prove right. And just a fair warning, a lot of this video from here on out will be discussing what victims experienced at the hands of Epstein and his associates. So if that's something you're unable to listen to, I completely understand and just wanted to make it very clear before we get into any of the details. Throughout the mid 90s to the early knots, Epstein would employ several tactics to prey on girls who primarily attended Palm Beach Gardens High School, Lake Worth Middle School, and Royal Palm Beach High, which the Palm Beach Post named Ground Zero in Epstein's operation. One of those girls was Michelle Licata, who was just 16 years old when she was approached by a friend at school in the days leading up to Christmas 2004. Michelle, who recalled to ABC working at a supermarket and being strapped for cash at the time, was looking to earn some money in order to buy her family gifts for the holidays. According to her friend, all Michelle needed to do was massage an old guy and she'd get $200. This made Michelle curious, and because she was led to believe the massage would take place in a professional environment, 
similar to the spas she had seen in the past, she obliged. It was only on the drive there that Michelle realized they weren't going to a professional facility. They were going to a house. And after finally arriving outside a sprawling mansion in a neighborhood she had never seen before, her friend hastily remarked that the man who lived inside might ask her to undress during the massage. Before she knew it, Michelle was whisked inside and led upstairs by several other women she had never met to a cold, dark bathroom where she was forced to encounter Jeffrey Epstein, lying face down on the massage table, talking on the phone. In that moment, Michelle was lost, confused, and left all alone with a man old enough to be her father. She then goes on to recount how Epstein molested her, noting that his face was enough to terrify her for the rest of her life. After the incident was over, Epstein paid her $200 and asked her to deliver another $100 bill to the friend who had brought her there. She got back in the car and told her friend what had happened, to which the friend responded, oh, that's okay, he tried to do that with my other friend too, as Michelle told Brown. Interestingly though, as Michelle told ABC, there were in fact other adults present at the estate. Gardeners, butlers, housekeepers, etc. It's just that they did nothing, as if they were used to seeing such girls come and go all the time. And as everyone knows now, that was the case. He did this frequently. When Palm Beach police began interviewing teenagers in 2005, they were astonished at what dozens told them about Jeffrey Epstein. Every girl that meets Jeffrey starts off with giving him a massage. The more you do with him, the more you make. Basically, if you take off your clothes, you're going to make more. If you let him do things to you, you're going to make more. I did it naked, but I wouldn't like let him touch me or anything like that. So after that, he's like, you know what? He's like, listen, I'll pay you $200 for every girl that you bring to me. He's like, oh, you know, do you need to make any extra money? I'm like, yeah. She's like, okay, I can give you, you know, like $200. There's this older guy in Palm Beach. He gets a lot of massages from girls. You know, that was really, that's all she told me. He asked me to take my shirt off, so I took my shirt off. Um, and that's how that was it. Did you ever take your panties off and be completely nude? Every now and then, yeah. It's like a train. It's like, I you introduce bring, them to all my them. friends, so I'll bring her friends, and then will bring her friends because on and on. Having underage girls come to his house to abuse was like a constant need for him, which unfortunately drastically impacted the trajectory of these young girls' lives. One victim by the name of Carolyn, who was abused by Epstein starting in 2001, testified in court that she had become addicted to pain pills and cocaine in an effort to block out the abuse she endured at 14 years old. She claimed to have visited Epstein upwards of 100 times growing up, and that she was at his Palm Beach residence multiple times a week for years. Carolyn tragically passed away of a fentanyl and methadone overdose in October 2023. Although police were able to identify a little over 30 victims in 2015, Julie K. Brown later discovered through her own research around 80 girls abused by Epstein just in Palm Beach alone. And those are only the ones we know about. Considering the wealth and the powerful connections Epstein would use as leverage over his young victims, it's no surprise that these girls were reluctant to speak with anyone about what had happened to them. Some, like Michelle, didn't even tell her parents until the police came knocking at her door a year later. Even now, there are victims who understandably don't want their identities out there. One anonymous woman in particular outlined these feelings to ABC in 2019. I almost felt scared to talk. Like, was I going to get in trouble? Did I do something wrong that I could be arrested? I was young. I had blamed myself for all these years. I was definitely scared to talk. But that's not to say some girls hadn't been talking from the beginning. Farmer says she reported the assault to the FBI, but she told us it wasn't for another decade, just before Epstein's first arrest in 2006 that an agent finally appeared at her door. Remember Maria Farmer, who I mentioned earlier, how she told police that Epstein assaulted her in Ohio? Well, unfortunately, that wasn't a lone incident. That same year, her 16-year-old sister, Annie Farmer, was also abused by Epstein and his then-girlfriend, Ghislaine, at their New Mexico ranch, with Annie writing in her diary at the time of how weird it was that Epstein had rubbed her hand and lower leg at a movie theater, before later being instructed by Ghislaine Maxwell to give Epstein a foot massage, with Ghislaine later touching the 16-year-old inappropriately in front of Epstein. Epstein also got into bed with Annie at one point during the trip. Maria's experience in Ohio was similar, with the couple essentially trapping her in the house and groping her in unison, mirroring each other's movements, as the New York Times put it. Maria claimed in an affidavit that Les Wexner's security staff essentially kept her there against her wishes for 12 hours after the assault took place. It was at this point that Maria 
and Annie realized what had happened to one another and tried to take action. Both sisters reported their experiences first to police, then to FBI, who did nothing, prompting the sisters to instead speak with Vanity Fair journalist Vicki Ward on the record in 2002. Being tasked with writing the now infamous profile The Talented Mr. Epstein for the magazine, you would think that Ward would obviously publish the allegations and expose Epstein and Ghislaine once and for all. Only somehow that didn't happen. Sure, the article did briefly reference Epstein's affinity for quote, mostly young girls among a sea of other breathtaking quotes used to humanize the man such as quote, Epstein is charming and quote, many people comment there is something innocent, almost childlike about Jeffrey Epstein. Making sure to hammer home the generous $25 million donation he had just made to Harvard for the creation of a mathematical biology and evolutionary dynamics program in Epstein's name. The article made zero mention of the allegations Ward had been told by the Farmer sisters. Since the release of this article, the blame for this little blunder has been pointed at numerous parties. Ward blames Vanity Fair's then editor-in-chief, Graydon Carter, for succumbing to Epstein's intimidation tactics and not including the allegations out of a combined lack of sympathy for the victims and that he actually believed Epstein's story over theirs. While Carter has referred to Ward as a serial liar, Isaac Chotner offered an extensive analysis of the claims made on both sides in his article last year for The New Yorker. I would highly recommend checking it out in full, along with Ward's two responses, to get the full story of what happened. But it ultimately boils down to a massive he said, she said. It's true that Carter does have a reputation of repressing stories in the past and seems pretty biased toward Epstein, according to transcripts released by Ward, but it should also be noted that Ward herself went on to write two more controversial pieces on Epstein. One in 2011 that praises Ghislaine pretty heavily, and another in 2008 where she describes Epstein as quote, perfectly charming, as he has been to me for years now, telling him over the phone, well, I guess you and I have a history by now, huh, Jeffrey? To which he responded, you know how many girls say that to me? In fact, Maria Farmer herself alleges it was Vicki Ward who ratted to Ghislaine about the sisters going to the FBI. Before all that, I was already in hiding because of Vanity Fair. Vicki Ward is, I'm going to tell you right now, she's a monster. She's a true monster. She's not a hero. We had to send a cease and desist letter because she's harassed my family for so long to try to save her face because she told Ghislaine Maxwell over drinks that I reported them to the FBI. Can you believe that? Holy shit. And so oh, sorry, this was swear. in 2002. But wow. In 2000, no, please, I curse my head off. She, for a year, promised us our safety. For a whole year. And see, I didn't meet with Graydon. I met with Vicky. And so Vicky's the one that's responsible here because she was the person who promised us our safety. And she promised us that she would protect the story, right? Since then, she calls and threatens, I own your story. I can write your story. If I, I mean, she's a, real, she's a real piece of work. Those at Vanity Fair had a responsibility to do right by Epstein's accusers then and provide a voice for the voiceless in 2003. But because they didn't, Epstein was able to continue his pattern of amusing girls for years. One thing I can assure you, though, is that this wasn't the last time Epstein's accusers would be given the cold shoulder by the media. In 2019, shortly after, after Epstein's death, a leaked video would make the rounds online depicting ABC journalist Amy Robach expressing disdain for the network quashing an exclusive interview she conducted with Epstein victim Virginia Jouffre years before the sex trafficker was ever arrested on federal charges. On a hot mic, Amy can be seen here telling her off-screen producers during a commercial break that she had the story three years ago and that the network offered a myriad of excuses as to why they wouldn't air Virginia's story back in 2015. I've had the story for three years. I've had this interview with Virginia Roberts. We would not put it on the air. Um, first of all, I was told, who's Jeffrey Epstein? No one knows who that is. This is a stupid story. Um, then the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us a million different ways. Um, we were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate I and Will say, oh, that we that also quashed the story. And then, um, and then Alan Dershowitz was also implicated in because of the planes. She told me everything. She had pictures. She had everything. She was in hiding for 12 years. We convinced her to come out. We convinced her to talk to us. Um, it was unbelievable what we had. Clinton. We had everything. I, I tried for three years to get it on. 
to no avail and now it's all coming out and it's like these new rel revelations and I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh my God, we, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. Other women backing it up. Hey, yep. Brad Edwards, the attorney, three years ago saying like, aunt, like, we, there will come a day when we will realize Jeffrey Epstein was the most prolific pedophile this country has ever known. And I had it all three years ago. A big factor here seemed to be Queen Elizabeth's son, Prince Andrew, whose name you likely associate with Jeffrey Epstein already. It's true the two have been photographed together on numerous occasions. He did say in a hugely infamous interview after Epstein's final arrest that he weirdly did not regret his friendship with the sex trafficker, uh, which is an insane thing to say, before stepping back from his royal duties in the wake of some pretty understandable outrage. Amy, though, says that it was partly the royal family who applied pressure on the news outlet. After learning what Virginia's allegations were. As subsequent court documents reveal, Virginia stated under oath that Epstein and Ghislaine began trafficking her in 2000 when she was still a teenager and that she was instructed by the pair to have sex with Andrew on three separate occasions in New York, London, and on Little St. James Island in 2001, claiming she was paid $15,000 in at least one of these instances. Somehow, as Business Insider recently reported, this allegation was not considered pertinent by the judge in this defamation case case Virginia had brought against Epstein and Ghislaine. Despite this, widely circulated photos showing a 17-year-old Virginia standing next to Prince Andrew and Ghislaine Maxwell just hours before one of the assaults, according to Virginia. But because ABC chose not to air any of this in 2015, these claims were not made public until 2019, to which Buckingham Palace immediately denied just before Prince Andrew made probably one of the biggest PR mistakes I have ever seen in my entire life. This utterly painful full interview that has gone on to haunt Prince Andrew ever since was conducted by the BBC in November 2019, advised against by his communications secretary, Jason Stein, who would notably quit his job immediately after this thing aired, which says enough right there. If anyone was on the fence about Andrew's guilt going into this thing, they certainly weren't anymore. Actually, it's a very good opportunity and I'm delighted to be able to see you today. Oh man, I'm sure you are. As you say, all of this goes back to your friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. It would be a, 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 a considerable stretch to say that he was a very, very close friend. About six minutes in, we learn that despite visiting Epstein's Palm Beach mansion, flying on the Lolita Express, staying at his New York estate, and taking a trip to his private island, Andrew, who was serving on Britain's full stop campaign, named to stamp out child sex trafficking, ironically, has never once seen any indication of what the financier was really up to. But things only start to get worse when the interviewer asks about Epstein's 2006 indictment, which is also the same year that Andrew invited Epstein out to his daughter's 18th birthday party across the pond. But even if Andrew was somehow not aware of any investigation by the time he sent that invitation, if he were truly innocent like he claims, he would have officially cut all communication in 2006, you'd think, right? I mean, after the indictment, he's no more talking to the pedophile, right? And that's something he says he maintained until 2010. Keyword there, until 2010. Well, I ceased contact with him after uh, I was aware that he was um, under investigation, and that was later on in, in 2006. And I wasn't in touch with him again until 2010, so um, I just... Uh, just this is why I don't understand the point of this interview. You are admitting to millions of people that you knowingly hung out with a convicted pedophile four years after you say you cut him off. What, did you just change your mind? You were against pedophilia in 2006, but you had a change of heart in 2010, and we're supposed to think you're innocent? By December of 2010, you went to stay with him at his New York mansion. Why? Why were you staying with a convicted sex offender? Right. Now, I went there with the sole purpose of saying to him that because he had been convicted, it was n inappropriate for us to be seen together. Oh, well, that plan really worked out, huh? You were literally photographed with him on that trip. I felt that doing it over the telephone was the chicken's way of doing it. I had to go and see him and talk to him. Yeah, man, we wouldn't want to disrespect the convicted pedophile, would we? And we had an opportunity to go for a walk in the park. And that was the conversation um, coincidentally that was photographed, which was when I said to him, I said, look, because of what has happened, I don't think it is appropriate 
that we should remain in contact. Prince Andrew thinks you are stupid enough to believe that someone just happened to snap a picture of him during the exact moment he was telling Epstein, hey man, you're a pedophile, we can't hang out anymore. Now, does anyone on the face of the earth believe that? You let him throw you a party with all those guests I mentioned earlier. We decided that we would part company and I left, I think it was the next day. Yep, just had to get one more night in at the pedo palace, huh? He didn't go into any great depth um, in the conversation about what I was doing and what he was doing. Very, very unfortunate Freudian slip there. Who advised you then that it was a good idea to go and break up the friendship? W w did that come from the palace? Was no, Her Majesty no, 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 the no, Queen no, involved? No, 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 no. You can tell he's extremely careful in this interview not to implicate the rest of his, well, slightly important family. Almost like he knows he massively messed up and probably did some heinous things behind closed doors. Which again, begs the question, why did he agree to this interview? I mean, don't get me wrong, I love it. I wish everyone involved with Epstein did an interview like this. I keep going, Andrew, this is great. He threw a party to yes. celebrate his release and you were invited as no, the guest go. of honor. Oh, it was a small dinner party, there were only eight or ten of us, I think, at the, at the, at the dinner. If there, was a, if there was a party, then I'd know nothing about that. Y you were invited to that dinner as a guest of honour? Well, I was there, so there was a dinner. I don't think it was quite as, as you might put it, but yeah, okay, I was there for a, <laughs> I was there at a dinner, yeah. Okay, let's say it was a dinner, okay? You, you moron. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many people came. You, you were still having a ball, yucking it up with your friends, the sex traffickers. You said you went to break up the relationship, and yet you stayed at that New York mansion several days. I'm wondering how but long... But I was doing a number of other things while I was there. But you were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. Oh man, I love how I just gives up at a certain point. Like, you knew she was gonna ask these questions. Why are you shocked that you're having to answer for your behavior? I mean, he is only a little entitled, I guess. The guy did grow up in a literal castle. At the time, I felt it was the, it was the honorable and right thing to do. My judgment was probably colored by my tendency to be too honorable. You heard it here first, everybody. The honorable thing to do is meet with a guy you know is a pedophile in person to tell him you can't be friends anymore over the course of a four day dinner party extravaganza. I mean, I just can't wrap my mind around this. So why wouldn't you announce this this breakup when you got back? Why wouldn't you publicly explain what you'd done? Oh, that, well, that's a great question. And the answer is because he's lying. He didn't take that trip to break up with him or whatever. That's an excuse he came up with from the looks of it 30 minutes before this interview, but you know, that's just my guess. One of Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yep. has made allegations against you. She says she met you in 2001. She says she dined with you, danced with you at Tramp Nightclub in London. She went on to have sex with you in a house in Belgravia belonging to Gerlen Maxwell, your friend. Your response? I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating. Uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat, um, or I didn't sweat at the time. And that was, oh, was she? Yes, I didn't sweat at the time. And it's only because I have done a number of things in the recent past that I'm starting to be able to do that again. So I'm afraid to say that, 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 that there's a medical condition that says that I didn't do it, so therefore. So in the midst of very shamelessly lying about his uh, sweating habits, Andrew goes on to rattle off a detailed alibi for himself on the specific evening that Virginia says the assault took place. And that's it before he goes on to say that, well, he might have met Virginia. And yes, in fact, he has seen the photograph of the two of them together, but strangely, he's unable to offer a convenient excuse for why such a photo exists. Other than, hey, maybe it's fake, right? And mind you, this was before the days of Mid Journey and Dolly, so if there's anyone out there who genuinely thinks this is the result of some master Photoshop work, I'd love to meet them, shake their hand, and ask them to get their eyes checked. You think it is you next to her in the photo? Oh, it's definitely me. I mean, that's a, that's a picture of me. It's not a picture of, I don't believe it's a picture of me in London, because when I go out, to, when I go out in London, I wear a suit and a tie. Oh yeah, here's a photo of him in London without a suit and tie, by the way. <laughs> he even looks like he's sweating a bit. If the first half of this interview was bad, the second half is almost unwatchable. He's shuddering all over the place, desperately in search for the right excuses while knowing deep down there is no way he could sell this thing. He's struggling to remember even the most basic details of the defense his team no doubt coached him to say. When was your last contact with her? Uh, it was earlier this year, funny enough, in the, in the summer. So even though he had by then been arrested, 
and was facing charges of no, sex trafficking. No, 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 no. This was this was early spring, I think. It was long because when was he arrested? July. No, it was before July. And that was the last time. Yeah, yeah. Because Did you I... discuss Epstein at all then? No, no. Actually, funnily enough. No, not at all. It's just an awesome way to end it. So when did you see Ghislaine? Oh, this summer, after Epstein got caught? Oh, uh, when, when was that? July? Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> that was way before that. <laughs> Long time before that, I can't promise you. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Now, I'm sure you already knew, at the very least, that this interview existed. I mean, it's one of the most infamous pieces of television, as far as I'm concerned. But what you may not know is that in response to Andrew's claims, Virginia spoke out in her own interview with the BBC the following month. In it, she recalls in vivid detail the traumatizing encounter with the prince and that all she could remember at the time was that she had just been abused by a member of the royal family. These powerful people were my chains, adding, he knows what happened, I know what happened. There's only one of us telling the truth and I know it's me. Over the following years, Virginia would file a lawsuit against Andrew specifically, accusing the prince of sexual assault, leading Andrew to hire the same lawyer who went on to work with none other than Colleen Bollinger just last year. But by February 2022, Andrew was forced to pay Virginia an out-of-court settlement, possibly, reportedly, financed in part by the Queen of England herself, who is also said to have contributed millions to her son's civil suit against Virginia, according to the Daily Telegraph. But Virginia's story doesn't end with Prince Andrew. In fact, an entire handful of Epstein's buddies were also implicated in the deposition released in 2019, along with a 139-page memoir written by Virginia, linked in the description below in full. If you take the time to read through all of it, you'll be presented with a first-person account of life inside Epstein's trafficking ring, and how she was first approached by Ghislaine Maxwell as a teenager, assisting her dad over the summer at Mar-a-Lago. With her hopes set on one day becoming a massage therapist, Virginia worked near the spa and would often read books on anatomy when business was slow. Virginia describes her first encounter with Ghislaine as follows. A lovely-looking woman in her late 30s who spoke with a proper English accent approached me. I assumed it was a general question like, where's the ladies' room, and was that a fancy model from so-and-so, but she was more interested in the book I was reading. Only believing at first that we were just making small talk, she was really intrigued by my choice of reading. She then asked if I do massages on the side, and I stated I was only reading the book and had not yet begun to study, but one day I would love to practice massage therapy. It wasn't long after that Ghislaine would mention this rich guy who happened to be looking for a massage therapist. Turning her down at first on account of her own inexperience in the field, Virginia eventually ended up accepting Ghislaine's contact information and couldn't wait to tell her dad the good news. We both thought this could be a wonderful opportunity to get my accreditation in massage therapy, she wrote. Seeing that it was a lady in her late 30s who came off as more of a nurturer rather than a procurer, neither of us saw any reason to be hesitant, which I think perfectly encapsulates the way Epstein and Ghislaine would weaponize these girls' personal aspirations against them. They knew exactly how to manipulate the desires and interests of their victims to extract what they wanted. What started off as this exciting chance to pursue her dreams turned into one of the darkest periods in Virginia's life. But it was supposed to be, you know, a massage therapy. And I thought, well, that might be a good job to learn. And when I met him, he was just in jeans in front of his mansion and just seemed like a regular guy. I had no idea what was going on. Virginia describes in vivid detail her first encounter with Epstein, along with her second, her third, her fourth, and so on. Before long, Virginia realized she had become one of Epstein's favorite, quote, new little toys, as she put it in her memoir, and went on to accompany him on frequent excursions all across the world. It was during her two years of being trafficked that Virginia claims she was forced to have sex not only with Epstein and Prince Andrew, which on one occasion involved the prince using a puppet lookalike of himself to grope another victim while he touched Virginia with his other hand, but also named a slew of other powerful clients. The list included the Harvard professor named Stephen, another prince whose name she couldn't recall, a Nobel Prize winning scientist, and an owner of a hotel chain who she described as a short, balding man with straggling remnants of curly brown hair. This owner, she claims, offered to pay her triple to work for him instead of Epstein. It's important to note here that Virginia was also being given high doses of Xanax during these years, unfortunately obscuring her recollection of certain 
certain specific names. One person she did mention by name though was former Senate Majority Leader and Disney Chairman George Mitchell, who obviously denies the claims. Though according to Virginia's memoirs, as well as her sworn deposition, Mitchell was just one of many recognizable figures of the high society that became added to my list of clientele. Of course, being introduced to for a lot more than just a client of massage. It's important to note here that most victims have testified that massage to Epstein and Ghislaine was code for sex. First meeting Mitchell at a dinner party attended by other esteemed billionaires and widely acclaimed scientists, Virginia wrote, my body was put on the banquet menu. Other prominent figures Virginia named include the late governor of New Mexico, Bill Richardson, who we also know received thousands of dollars in campaign donations from Epstein, billionaire hedge fund manager Glenn Dubin, who Virginia says had sex with her while his pregnant wife was asleep in the next room. His wife being Epstein's former girlfriend, Eva Anderson, by the way. And of course, French modeling agent Jean-Luc Brunel, who Virginia says she was sent to have sex with at many places. But one man Eileen Ford does associate with in Paris is this man, the head of Karen Models, one of the largest and most prestigious agencies in the country. His name is Jean-Luc Brunel. Brunel has always carried a reputation of being an absolute monster, dating as far back as the late 80s when a 60 Minutes investigation spearheaded by Diane Sawyer revealed his habit of drugging and abusing models from all over the world. His elusiveness earned him the nickname Le Fetome, or The Ghost, by French prosecutors. Brunel is also a noted longtime personal friend of Epstein, with flight logs indicating he took at least 25 trips on the Lolita Express from 1998 to 2005. According to a report from The Independent, Brunel established an agreement that he would use his influence within the world of fashion to scope out underage girls to groom for Epstein, noting that Brunel continued this work even in the years following his firing from his original agency. He simply started the new one, of which Epstein invested over $1 million to help get off the ground. Brunel was also known for leaving cryptic messages for Epstein at his Palm Beach residence, according to further unsealed court documents. A few examples that have made their way to the press include just did a good one 18 years, and he has a teacher for you to teach how to speak Russian. She is two at times eight years old, not blonde. Lessons are free and you can have your first today if you call. Epstein had proudly slept with over 1,000 of Brunel's girls, according to Virginia, who also claimed that Brunel once gifted Epstein 12-year-old French triplets for his birthday. As a part of her sworn deposition, Virginia recalled that Jeffrey bragged after he met them that they were 12-year-olds and flown over from France because they're really poor over there and their parents needed the money, adding that she had in fact seen these triplets with her own eyes. She continued, He was so excited about the entire event, replayed it over and over again over the next course of weeks, how cute they were, and how you could tell they were really young. He went on to tell me how Brunel bought them in Paris from their parents, offering them the usual sums of money, visas, and modeling career prospects. Laughing the whole way through, Jeffrey thought it was absolutely brilliant how easily money seduced all walks of life, nothing or no one that couldn't be bought. The triplets were flown back to France after Epstein was done with them. Brunel, unsurprisingly, denied all allegations in 2015, but following Epstein's arrest four years later, a new French investigation was launched into the disgraced modeling agent. And in December 2020, Brunel was finally arrested, taken into custody on charges of rape sexual assault against minors, sexual harassment, criminal conspiracy, and trafficking human beings. While awaiting trial in February 2022, the 76-year-old Brunel was found hanging in his prison cell dead. He died exactly the same way that Jeffrey Epstein did as well, and also that he wasn't necessarily on suicide watch facing these charges. Yes, man, these parallels are so striking. Virginia saw a lot of famous people during her time with Epstein, one being Les Wexner, who she said she had sex with possibly more than five times, according to unsealed court documents. Some additional names Virginia mentioned were MIT professor Marvin Minsky, who she says had sex with her on Little St. James Island, billionaire Tom Pritzker, and of course, Simpsons creator Matt Groening, who she claims to have given a foot massage during a flight to Los Angeles, recounting how she almost threw up at the shape of his feet. Writing in her memoir, he had yellow crushed 
bushy toenails that even someone with a chainsaw would have had troubles cutting through. And then there was the fluffy balls of leftover pieces of sock wedged between the crevices of his sweaty toes. In return, he allegedly compensated her with a drawing of Homer and Bart Simpson made out to her brother and father. Amidst the vast sea of names implicated by Virginia, however, there was one very notable person that stood out among the rest. I don't, I don't really know why you like to defend these high profile clients. Do you regret it at all? And did you ever see anything untoward about Mr. Epstein? Alan Dershowitz is a criminal defense attorney who has spent much of his life teaching at Harvard in between representing the most controversial figures he could find. He began his career defending three far-right terrorists accused of planting a bomb in the Manhattan office of Imprezio Saul Hirok, successfully getting them off before helping to get another certified good guy off the hook a couple years later. For those of you listening right now, I can't see the screen, it's O.J. Simpson. You, you, yeah, he was O.J. Simpson's lawyer in 1995 and would go on to provide his services for Mike Tyson during his rape case, Donald Trump during his first impeachment, where he argued argued it's not illegal for Trump to bribe the Ukrainian president, and was also Harvey Weinstein's lawyer, despite insisting on the view what a big supporter of the Me Too movement he was. In his six decades of being a public figure, Dershowitz has also argued in favor of torture during the Iraq war, wrote about lowering the legal age of consent to 16, went to extreme length to deny tenure for pro-Palestinian professor Norm Finkelstein after a heated debate the two of them had on Israel, and is actually said to defend the state of Israel against allegations of war crimes at the International Court of Justice sometime in the near future. And of course, he was also the lawyer of Jeffrey Epstein, of whom he considered at one point to be a good friend. In fact, when asked if he'd still be close to Epstein in the event the financier could no longer afford legal counsel in 2003, Dershowitz replied, absolutely, I would be as interested in him as a friend if we had hamburgers on the boardwalk in Coney Island and talked about his ideas. What ideas? <laughs> when he was writing his book, he told Vicki Ward that the only person he'd send drafts to outside of his immediate family was Jeffrey Epstein. Ward also notes that Dershowitz was thrilled to meet none other than Prince Andrew at Epstein's Manhattan residence one time, even letting the prince hang out in the back of his lectures. I'm thrilled that all these papers have come out. I urged them, I went to court, I asked for everything to come out because I knew that I had done nothing wrong and the papers would exculpate me. I want to make sure every single document comes out. The public has the right to see everything. Virginia Giuffre first accused Alan Dershowitz of sexual abuse in a 2014 sworn affidavit, claiming under oath that she was forced to have sex with the professor on at least six separate occasions, even appearing to get physically sick as she tried to describe the alleged encounters to attorneys. The first time she ever met the Harvard professor, Virginia said on the record, was at the office of Epstein's Manhattan home, which we know from the Vanity Fair article Dershowitz was known to visit. While she stresses it's hard for her to remember things chronologically, she said, says she is able to recall the most recent time she had sex with Dershowitz, which allegedly happened on an airplane in Massachusetts, as well as the first time in Epstein's bedroom minutes after the financier had left the room. Dershowitz walked in, and Virginia claims they had sex on a red velvet chair. Afterwards, Epstein asked Virginia if he enjoyed it, to which she told him yes. She also claimed that Dershowitz participated in sexual activity in a black limousine involving herself, Epstein, Dershowitz, and another young girl on the way to Dershowitz's house. Virginia also emphasized just how a where Dershowitz was of all the other young girls constantly around Epstein. Stating in her affidavit, Dershowitz was so comfortable with the sex that was going on that on one occasion he observed me in sexual activity with Epstein. Virginia also alleged she witnessed Dershowitz having sex with another one of Epstein's young victims at one point, a blonde girl who she assumed to be underage. Dershowitz has since lashed out hard against Virginia, who he's referred to as a borderline pathological liar out to destroy his career in pursuit suit of money. What happened next was a complicated years-long series of lawsuits in which Virginia went after Dershowitz for defamation, causing Dershowitz to countersue, eventually concluding with a settlement in 2022. After this settlement, Virginia told reporters that she, quote, may have made a mistake in accusing Dershowitz of abusing her. This has now given Dershowitz the green light to openly parade his supposed innocence in a barrage of media appearances, telling everyone who will listen about how wrongfully victimized he was by 
by an attention-seeking liar, and that this is what finally exonerates him. But that's not exactly a fair characterization of the settlement, according to Virginia. As Dershowitz was taking his public victory lap, Virginia told the Daily Beast in an exclusive statement, I was shocked to read that Alan Dershowitz is claiming that our mutual dismissal of our lawsuits against each other somehow exonerated him. The litigation was very stressful and damaging to my family and to my health. We have endured years in which Mr. Dershowitz asserted my charges against him were a lie, made up out of whole cloth, perjury, and part of a purported extortion plot. He has now admitted there was no perjury, no extortion plot, and rather than making up what I said, I honestly believe the charges I made against him. Whether or not Mr. Dershowitz's admissions undermine his previous denials of the charges made against him is for others to say. The settlement agreement limits what I can say and I will abide by it unless and until I am released from it. However, those admissions are not consistent with exoneration. I can tell you she is still a prostitute. She is selling false stories now for money about me. Do you have any concern calling her a prostitute when she was victimized at such a young age by this wealthy man? She was not victimized. She made her own decisions in life. And at the age of 15, some would say that's a little yeah, young and that she was taken advantage of. I'm talking about the age of 19. Look, that's between her and the federal government and the people that she claims victimized her. For what it's worth, I think it should also be said that Virginia had in fact told several people about Dershowitz being involved with Epstein's operation years before her affidavit. And for Dershowitz's part, it would seem he was totally fine with a friend of his making a quote-unquote joke about Epstein housing young girls in 2014. Virginia also reiterated to the Daily Beast that Mr. Dershowitz sued Mr. Boyce, her lawyer, for charging Mr. Dershowitz with participating in Epstein's sex trafficking and other misconduct. Mr. Boyce did not retract any of those charges. Charges. But Mr. Dershowitz nevertheless dismissed his claims against Mr. Boyce. That too hardly seems like exoneration. And if that's not enough, another Epstein victim, Sarah Ransom, also accused Dershowitz of having sex with her while she was being trafficked by Epstein. To this day, Ransom has never retracted her allegations against Dershowitz. All the feminist groups and the radicals who think this is the worst thing in the world that anybody ever had any contact with Jeffrey Epstein. Where are all those radical feminists when it comes to the Hamas rapes of young Jewish girls, sexual abuse, beheadings? They are quiet. They are silent. The incredible hypocrisy of the Me Too movement me too, except if you're a Jew. One of the first times Jeffrey Epstein made national headlines was in 2002, in this article written by Landon Thomas Jr., who, by the way, would also go on to write an extremely positive piece for the financier after he was sentenced for procuring an underage girl for prostitution and before getting fired from the New York Times for admitting he was still friends with the convicted pedophile. Oh, he also asked Epstein for $30,000 in 2017, according to the Daily Beast, so that's fun. Pretty normal guy. Anyway, in this article, he uses language like he collects beautiful minds, and Epstein brings a trophy hunter's zeal to his collection of scientists and politicians. And that last part certainly isn't wrong. As subsequent data from the Center of Responsive Politics shows, Epstein donated to a litany of politicians from both the right and the left, including Chuck Schumer, Bob Dole, Bob Packwood, Elliot Spitzer, and even former President George H.W. Bush. But of those names is a politician who's long been associated with Epstein since the mid-90s. Someone who Virginia says she met on Little St. James, and someone who's already been caught lying about his connection to the late pedophile. Newly released Jeffrey Epstein court filings revealing more alleged ties to many people, including Bill Clinton. Epstein was hanging around the 42nd president as early as 1993, a month after he was sworn into office, according to visitor logs provided by the Clinton Presidential Library. Epstein and Ghislaine visited again in September of that year after Epstein made a $10,000 donation to help refurbish the Oval Office, according to this letter from Bernard R. Meyer, the VP of of the White House Historical Association, thanking Epstein for his generous contribution. Overall, it's been reported that Epstein visited the Clinton White House a grand total of 17 times, accompanied by eight women, four of which being former girlfriends, according to these logs, which show that Epstein popped in and out of the White House twice in one day on three separate occasions, though there seems to be no stated purpose for any of these visits. Clinton also attended a three-hour private dinner hosted by former Revlon owner 
Ron Perlman and other elites in Palm Beach in 1995, a meeting that Clinton had not mentioned until a 28-year-old newspaper snippet obtained by Snopes confirmed it. In the wake of the Epstein story being revitalized by his arrest and death in 2019, Clinton has taken very conscious steps to distance himself from who he once called a highly successful financier and committed philanthropist. After all, Epstein's own lawyers asserted in court documents that Epstein was part of the original group that conceived the Clinton Global Initiative. A fun fact about the Clinton Global Initiative, by the way, is that they once endorsed the Terra Mar Project, an environmental NGO with the self-stated goal of conserving, protecting, and improving oceans, seas, and coastlines. Who founded the Terra Mar Project, you ask? <laughs> Great question. Let's check it. Oh, oh, whoops. I mean, Snopes has verified that Ghislaine Maxwell did also attend Chelsea Clinton's wedding in 2010, featured it right there in the middle. I <laughs> mean, not even in the background or anything. I just didn't even want to hide it. After all, though, she did take the president's daughter out on a yacht trip a year earlier in 2009. Epstein was literally serving a jail sentence, while at the same time, the woman who helped him find victims was <laughs> taking the president's daughter on a trip through the open seas. But whatever, I'm, I'm going insane. Let's take it back to 2002, when Landon Thomas Jr. wrote for the first time about the Clinton-Epstein world tour extravaganza the two men embarked upon. Visiting New York, Paris, Bangkok, Brunei, Norway, Morocco, Brussels, and need I go on, all in hopes of providing humanitarian aid for continents like Africa, spreading democracy, empowering the poor, and combating HIV and AIDS, according to a Clinton spokesperson shortly after the trip. Some of the other notable passengers on this famed international excursion included the likes of Chris Tucker and Kevin Spacey, who you can actually see sitting here on Queen Elizabeth's throne next to Ghislaine. According to the Daily Telegraph, they were taking a tour of Buckingham Palace led by Prince Andrew. Ah, I love recurring characters. In fact, despite Clinton originally insisting he had only taken four rides on the Lolita Express, flight logs indicate Clinton actually took at least 26 rides on Epstein's private jet shortly after leaving office between 2001 and 2003, an assertion that he still has not directly responded to. You wonder why that is. It's pretty out of character from the lie to the American public, I think we all know. Virginia has never made any allegations of wrongdoing against Clinton himself, but her assertions do go a little further than what the former president has admitted to doing. Virginia stated in her sworn deposition that she personally met Clinton on Little St. James Island at least twice during her travels with Epstein, something that Clinton has long denied across the board, describing in her memoir an alleged dinner where there were only a few of us eating at the dinner table. There was Jeffrey at the head of it all, as always. On the left side was Emmy, another Epstein recruiter, Ghislaine and I. Sitting across the table from us was Bill, with two lovely girls who were visiting from New York. Bill's wife, Hillary's absence from the night made it easy for his apparent provocative cheeky side to come out. Teasing the girls on either side of him with playful pokes and brassy comments, there was no modesty between any of them. We all finished our meals and scattered in our own different directions. Strolling into the darkness with two beautiful girls around either arm, Bill seemed content to retire for the evening. Now, to Clinton's credit, flight logs obtained through an FOIA request have presented no evidence that he attended the island. Now, yes, he flew with Epstein more times, such way more times than he originally cared to admit. But those same flight records also don't do a lot to imply he ever visited Little St. James. But along with Virginia's sworn deposition, we also have former Clinton aide Doug Band, who Clinton kept in his inner circle even after leaving the White House. Band himself has even flown on the Lolita Express with the former president, just to give you an idea of how close these two were. Band has also alleged for years that Clinton has in fact visited Little St. James, specifically in January of 2003. Band did not attend this alleged visit, as he told Vanity Fair it was one of the few trips he declined. It's worth noting the Clinton camp has provided detailed travelogue entries of the period in question that do not contain a visit, as Vanity Fair goes on to clarify. But then you have Steve Scully, a former employee of Epstein's in charge of the island's telecommunication for six years, who not only claimed to have seen Prince Andrew groping and kissing Virginia near a pool, he says, but also stated in the Netflix documentary Filthy Rich that he once witnessed Bill Clinton sitting on a porch on the island next to Epstein. Virginia only doubling down in the documentary with, I remember having dinner with Clinton. He was there and I never saw him do anything improper. I wish, you know, he would just come clean about it. Like, yeah, I was there. So what? Who cares? I didn't see anything going on. Any comments on the alleged uh, allegation of your uh, connection with Jeffrey Epstein? Now, 
I don't think I have to tell you that Republicans with a hate boner for Clinton have absolutely done everything they can to emphasize his murky relationship with the billionaire. Or millionaire, I guess we don't know how much Epstein was really worth. And I don't think there's anything wrong at all with bringing up those connections. I mean, you should ask questions about it, especially when you consider Clinton has lied about it. But those on the right who only single out Bill Clinton's relationship with Epstein should probably look in the mirror. Well, I knew him like everybody in Palm Beach knew him. I mean, people in Palm Beach knew him. He was a fixture in Palm Beach. Uh, I had a falling out with him a long time ago. I don't think I've spoken to him for 15 years. Here. As Landon Thomas wrote in his New York Magazine profile, Epstein likes to tell people that he's a loner, a man who's never touched alcohol or drugs, and one whose nightlife is far from energetic. And yet, if you talk to Donald Trump, a different Epstein emerges. I've known Jeff for 15 years. Terrific guy. Trump booms from a speakerphone. He's a lot of fun to be with. It is even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do. And many of them are on the younger side, no doubt about it. Jeffrey enjoys his social life. Sorry for doing the voice. I, I couldn't quote him and not do the voice. This quote, which again dates all the way back to 2002, is remarkable considering what Trump has said about Epstein more recently, assuring journalists in 2019 from the White House that I was not a fan of his. That I can tell you. I was not a fan of his. So was he just being a fake friend? friend all along then? You, you were fake for 15 years? You said he was a good hang. Alvin Dershowitz, who of course represented both men in court, told the New York Times that in those days, if you didn't know Trump and you didn't know Epstein, you were a nobody. I didn't even know this until researching this video, but apparently Epstein liked to say he was the one who introduced Donald Trump to Melania. According to Vanity Fair, which also reported in 2021, that Ghislaine kept up to 16 of Trump's phone numbers in the infamous Little Black Book. She would also invite the future president to dinners and events all over the state of New York, their most infamous get-together being caught on this now widely circulated video of an extremely coked up looking Trump clapping and dancing and whispering into the ear of Epstein, who he's not a fan of by the way. The pair is standing in front of a swarm of young models at a private Mar-a-Lago party and seem to be having a grand old time. I'm sure you've seen the video, but what you may not know is that the same year this was filmed, Trump and Epstein held another private party in Palm Beach where 20 28 women were in attendance. The only men at this party, though, were Trump and Epstein. At least according to the man who supplied the women. George Haraney of American Dream Enterprises tells the New York Times that he actually warned Trump of Epstein's proclivities toward young women. Asking Trump in disbelief, you're telling me it's you and Epstein? I know Jeff really well, and I can't have him going after younger girls. Well, Haraney says he had to ban Epstein from events, Trump didn't care about that. A claim that goes directly against against what one Trump campaign manager later said, which is that Trump did eventually stop letting Epstein hang around events because he was too creepy, which in my opinion is a little out of character for Donald Trump. It's hard to deny Trump's reputation with women, especially younger women, isn't exactly the greatest. There is definitely some indication that Trump was aware of the young girls in Epstein's vicinity. Some insight coming from his future White House aide, Roger Stone, who told the New York Times in an effort to defend Trump, I think, that the former former president once said, the swimming pool was filled with beautiful young girls. How nice, I thought. He let the neighborhood kids use the pool after seeing Epstein's home in Palm Beach. And to make matters even more strange, journalist Craig Unger concluded his Vanity Fair examination of Trump and Epstein's relationship with the following passage. An associate of Epstein's who asked not to be identified told me that Epstein showed him one photo of Trump with a topless young girl. In another, the source said that Trump is with two girls who are said to be laughing as they point out what appears to be a wet spot in an unfortunate location on his pants. The description of the photo suggested that it was a semen stain, but the photos have never been released. But by being in the news, it does feed into what Mark Epstein once reportedly heard from his older brother Jeff when it came to the 2016 election. As Mark told the New York Post recently, here's a direct quote, if I said what I know about both candidates, they'd have to cancel the election. That's what Jeffrey told me in 2016. What that means exactly, we may never know.
The two New York natives wouldn't stay friends forever though. While the exact reason for their split is still uncertain, it seemed to happen around 2005 when Epstein threatened to sue Trump over his purchase of a 65,000 square foot property Epstein had set his sights on. Which was also once owned by Les Wexner, by the way, another fun fact. The thing never actually went to court, but it's been reported that Epstein himself once theorized that it was actually Donald Trump who tipped off local police in Palm Beach as a kind of retaliation for the threat. Sure, we know Trump is a petty guy, but authorities ultimately began looking into Epstein because of what young girls in the community had been saying. Unfortunately for them, the efforts of these prosecutors would tragically prove pretty feckless. Breaking news in the fallout from the 2008 plea deal involving Palm Beach County billionaire Jeffrey Epstein. Just hours ago, Labor Secretary Alex Acosta, as we've reported, vigorously defended his oversight of that plea deal. Mr. Acosta is doing everything he can to divert attention away from his own responsibility. And tonight we are still waiting on a statement from former Palm Beach County State Attorney Barry Krischer. So this video ended up being a lot longer than I originally planned. I'm afraid if we don't split this into multiple videos, we may not get to cover everything as extensively as I'd like. But you can expect part two to explore the horrendous plea agreement that allowed Jeffrey Epstein to avoid life in prison, along with the connections he maintained after he was a convicted sex offender, his second arrest in 2019, and of course, whether or not he truly killed himself in custody. That video should come out about a week after this one, if all goes well. But if not, I'll let you know on Twitter at JAubreyYT. I don't really end videos like this, so I'm not really sure what else to say other than subscribe to Ground News, read Julie K. Brown's book, and I am having no suicidal ideation. Could you please give us your name? Jeffrey Epstein. Is it true, sir, that um, you have what's been described as an egg-shaped penis? Your penis is oval shaped and claim when erect, it was thick towards the bottom, but was thin and small towards the head portion and called it egg shaped. Those are not my words, I apologize. But as Mr. Now adjourned. As Mr. Critton has stated that this is a I'm willing to continue. I okay.